This is the second uh, video of chapter 7. This one is on the planet Saturn. To get to Saturn um, requires what is called gravitational slingshotting. Uh, the Cassini orbiter, which was sent to Saturn recently, was um, propelled actually towards Venus to, in order to steal some of Venus's um, uh, momentum as it's going around the sun and hence pick up a greater speed um, from taking that momentum from the planet. So actually rather than shooting at Saturn, we actually shoot at Venus, pick up some momentum, maybe it comes back to Earth, picks up some of Earth's momentum, goes back to Venus, picks up momentum, and then is projected out towards the um, outer solar system towards Jupiter, get a gravity boost from that, and then go to um, Saturn. So that's exactly what the Cassini did. And we can see it did a flyby by Venus in 1998, another flyby in 1999, went by Earth in 1999, each time picking up more speed, free energy. So you don't have to have all this rocket energy. There's no way we could have a rocket that big to get this much energy. Hence, it can go to the outer solar system much faster, get there in a few years rather than many years. Uh, it went by uh, Jupiter, picked up a last bit of uh, gravitational slingshotting there, and finally arrived at Saturn. A lot of what we know about Saturn now is from the recent mission of Cassini uh, to Saturn. Saturn is the most distant planet known to ancient astronomers. Uh, it's, much, it's much further than Jupiter, and it's, it's clearly seen um, by the naked eye, and of course uh, regarded as the most beautiful site in our solar system. Named for the Roman god of agriculture, actually uh, the father of Zeus, Kronos, uh, is also called in, in the Roman world Saturn. Kronos was the one who swallowed all of his children so that, because he had been prophesied that one of his children would, uh, would, um, revolt and, uh, dethrone him. And, uh, his wife, uh, Rhea, um, made him eat a stone instead of um, Zeus, so that uh, he wouldn't eat all of his children, and eventually Zeus was the one who overthrew him. Saturn is the only planet that is less dense than water. So if Saturn were a huge beach ball, it actually would float on water. It's the only planet that would do so, less dense than water. It's a gaseous fluid object. It has no solid surface. It does have a rocky core, but basically before you get there, it would be purely gas and ice layers before you got to that rocky core. Saturn's gravity is 2.5 times less than Jupiter, so it's actually more on the order of uh, similar to, to our gravity. It's only 40% that of Jupiter. And Saturn has, at least in this accounting, 31 moons. Um, some accountings have as many as 48 moons for currently for Saturn. In this picture, you can see four of them near the equator of the planet. Here's a beautiful picture. Radius of Saturn is 9.5 times the radius of the Earth. The mass of Saturn is 95 times greater than the mass of Earth. Saturn's distance from the Sun is 9.5 astronomical units, so it's 9.5 times greater than our distance from the Sun. And Saturn revolves around the sun 
uh, in 29.5 Earth years. So these are all easy numbers to remember. Radius is 9.5 times, mass is 95 times, distance is 9.5 astronomical units, time around the sun is 29.5 Earth years. If we were to rate Saturn on a scale of 1 to 10, it probably would come out as a 9.5. Saturn undergoes rapid differential rotation, which means uh, the differential means that uh, not all parts of its uh, atmosphere are rotating at the same rate. It requires 9.5 hours to complete one rotation. Now, actually, it's um, 10.5 hours, so that quite didn't quite fit into that 9.5 zone, but it's pretty close. The rotation axis is tilted 27 degrees from its orbital plane, and that's a similar tilt to Earth, Mars, and Neptune. So we have four planets that are within about three degrees of tilt of each other. Another nice picture of Saturn. Saturn's equatorial flow reaches 1,500 kilometers per hour. That's much more than hurricane strength. That is uh, maybe 10 times hurricane strength. About 90, 950 miles per hour, so that's easy to remember. Uh, winds of 950 miles per hour, so that is more than 10 times hurricane strength if a hurricane is 74 miles per hour uh, officially. So uh, those would be winds that we have not any uh, idea how bad that would be. Saturn has cloud bands like Jupiter, but less colorful. Here's a recent picture, though, and that looks pretty good. The cloud level is three times thicker due to less gravity, and the cloud thickness doesn't allow the lower belts to be seen. So it's a little bit more uniform in color than Jupiter, but in this picture, you can see some some distinction of the bands, and also uh, what is called a dragon storm over here. Interesting storm here um, in this band over here. Saturn's atmosphere is composed mostly of hydrogen, 92.4 percent, and helium, 7.4 percent, with traces of ammonia methane, and water vapor. The helium amount is lower than, say, Jupiter's um, because it's believed that the helium is condensing and raining coreward towards the planet, the rest of the planet. So uh, helium is the rain on Saturn. The temperature of the cloud tops is 95 degrees Kelvin, or about minus 285 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's a look at Saturn's atmosphere. You have a stratosphere, troposphere, ammonia ice layer, ammonium hydrosulfide ice, just like on Jupiter, but you, you don't see these brown bands as prevalent, and probably water ice below that. Helium is absent in the outer atmosphere because it condenses and rains inward toward the core. This allows Saturn's atmosphere to heat up, and Saturn emits uh, more heat due to this condensation of <clears throat> the helium gas. This is uh, to what uh, Earth experiences um, in its water condensation. So. Near, near the Earth's equator, as heat is hitting the equator, um, water evaporates and then condenses and it, um, releases more heat, helps to fuel the structure of storms like hurricanes, and the same sort of thing is, is happening on Saturn.
Here's a nice picture uh, using false color revealing with more detail the belt spans and spotty storms that are similar to uh, Jupiter. Here's a closer look. Some spotty storms and fan-like structure. Very, very beautiful picture. Here's Saturn. And if we were to able to look inside Saturn, what would we what would we see? Let's uh, t let's take a look. As so we looked into the interior of Saturn, we would find an an atmosphere on the surface, and then uh, sort of a mantle of fluid metallic um, molecular hydrogen. Uh, and then as we get closer to the core, metallic hydrogen, hydrogen in its metallic form, because hydrogen is a metal. And uh, so in this sort of outer core, this uh, metallic material is swirling around, helping to develop the magnetic field of Saturn. And possibly inside that, a rocky core, which um, is larger than the size of Earth, maybe 15 times the mass of Earth in that rocky core. Saturn emits three times as much energy as it receives from the Sun, so it's actually emitting energy. And this is believed to come from the helium rain condensing, releasing the energy, and uh, this energy um, being emitted. This is more energy than any other planet, or more of a factor of energy than any other planet to release three times as much as you receive. Here's a look at Saturn's magnetic field as compared to the Earth. The Earth, as we know, spins pretty rapidly uh, in 24 hours. And because of its spin and its interior material of iron and metals, uh, creates a, a significant enough magnetic field. And this kind of result of spinning this material and creating a magnetic field is called the dynamo effect. And like Jupiter and the Earth, Saturn is also a good example of the dynamo effect, the dynamo theory, which means that with the spin, yeah, the spin axis, the magnetic poles are actually aligned pretty close to the rotation or spin axis. For Saturn, uh, this magnetic field is caused by the spinning metallic hydrogen. Its field is only 1 20th as strong as Jupiter's, so maybe it doesn't have as much metallic hydrogen. However, that is still a thousand times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, so it's still a very significant and large magnetic field. And with any magnetic field, you would have the effect as it comes near the poles of auroras. So Saturn traps charged particles near its poles. And uh, we have auroral displays at the poles. And here's some very nice pictures showing this these auroras uh, near the um, geographic poles of Saturn. Here's a picture taken by the Chandra X-ray uh, telescope. And it's showing that Saturn is actually emitting X-rays about its equator. This picture taken in 2004. This is unlike Jupiter, which emits X-rays at its poles. And uh, the reason for this is still unknown. So there's no reason to know. I mean, it's probably due somehow to the way that the metallic hydrogen is spinning but it's um, still not known why there's a difference between Saturn and Jupiter and why, why it's um, emitting these x-rays at all. Here's another recent discovery of Saturn. Saturn has two large storms uh, at each respective pole, huge storms at each respective pole.
unusual in nature to have such a beautiful structure um, somewhat randomly, or maybe not randomly, it has probably something to do with the inner makings of Saturn. Well, we have this hexagonal structure at the North Pole and another round storm at the South Pole, both, both large storms at the poles. Here's a look at that North Pole storm. And uh, as you look at this, I want you to really focus in on this storm as we take a look at it as it rotates over time. Really look at it good. Look at the center of this picture really well. You like astronomy, don't you? You do. You like astronomy, don't you? Uh, oh, sorry. Here's a look at Saturn. You can see uh, four of its moons here near the a equatorial plane, the same plane as the uh, rings. Not sure which moons those are. Here's another great look at Saturn. You can see the ring. We're looking at edge on here. See, see the ring system. We see some moons right near that equatorial plane. Beautiful picture. And here's Titan over here. And you can see the shadow of Titan down here on the planet Saturn. So what a great picture. Most of Saturn's moons are found near that equatorial plane along with the rings. And all but one of the moons orbit prograde with the planet. So the planet is going prograde around the sun uh, counterclockwise. The planet is spinning prograde. And the moons are spinning uh, prograde, revolving prograde around Saturn itself. So this suggests an origin with the planet, that these moons are actually um, having residual effects of the same effects of the solar system itself, all this prograde motion, except for one uh, satellite around Saturn. Here's another great picture. And we can see actually Titan is eclipsing the planet, so we're looking we're just lucky enough in this picture that Titan is actually uh, on the image of the planet. And we can see the shadow of Titan again on the planet as well. Here's a picture of the moon Mimas on against uh, the ring system, or Saturn's northern hemisphere. But the, so the shadows on the northern hemisphere are from the ring system. Here's Dion, also uh, against the planet Saturn in the background. It's a great picture. Here's Phoebe. Phoebe is Saturn's only moon to orbit retrograde. As you look at Phoebe, it kind of looks like an asteroid. So it probably was a captured asteroid. So um, most of the moons are going prograde. The one moon that's going the opposite direction is probably was captured after the formation sometime later as a captured asteroid. Here's Iapetus. Iapetus turns as it revolves, so it's gravitationally fixed to Saturn. So it's always showing the same face to Saturn. And in fact, its forward face is dark in color. And its, its reverse face is light in color. So it's possibly picking up material as it's going through its orbit about Saturn that has darkened the forward face. More on these moons later when, we, when we're specifically talking about the uh, Jovian moons. We're just trying to do an overview here.
Here's a look at Rhea. As we said, Rhea was the uh, the wife of Kronos, or Saturn. And uh, so here's a moon named after uh, Saturn's wife. The second largest moon of Saturn. After Titan. And Kronos was the father of the Titans. Here is Titan. This picture taken by Voyager 2, or I'm sorry, Voyager 1. Titan has an atmosphere of nitrogen 90%, argon 10%, and methane, a trace of methane. Our atmosphere on Earth is about 80% nitrogen, but a primordial Earth probably had a atmosphere very similar to Titan's, about 90% nitrogen, traces of these other uh, gases, n not any oxygen. That's what a primordial Earth probably was like. This atmosphere is actually denser than our atmosphere. It's about 60% denser, producing the reddish color. And this is the Voyager photo. In other words, the Voyagers were sent out to look at all the Jovian planets, the two Voyager spacecraft. And when they got to Saturn, they saw Titan. They said, well, Titan has some Earth-like features. You know, this atmosphere, this thick atmosphere with nitrogen. That's pretty interesting. So Voyager 1 was sacrificed to look at Titan. So uh, Voyager 2 went on to look at the other Jovians. Voyager 1 was moved off course to take this picture of Titan, and that's all it got, though, just this fuzzy picture of Titan. So it was kind of a, a letdown that it didn't get more, uh, more from its uh, uh, diversion. Here's a more recent picture of Titan. This one was taken by the Cassini orbiter, which, uh, as we said, finally reached Saturn in uh, 2003 and took this picture of Titan in 2004. The bright region on this picture is called Xanadu. Cassini had a probe called the Huygens probe, named after Christian Huygens, who uh, has gotten credit for uh, discovering, or at least identifying the rings of Saturn. And uh, so this probe was launched into Titan to try to um, investigate Titan. And hence, uh, as, as uh, Cassini got close, it launched this probe into Titan, into this area here. Here's a blow up of the eventual touchdown area of the Huygens probe. As the probe descended, it started taking pictures of the surface of Titan. And here was a very interesting picture. It kind of looks like a shoreline to a lake, some kind of sea boundary, highlands and lowlands. And indeed, probably is a lake, but it's not a lake of water. It is a lake of methane liquid methane. Here are some inflow channels into this lake. So we have um, what appears to be rivers and channels and lakes of that water, but liquid fuel, methane or ethane uh, combination uh, on Titan. Because on Titan, the atmosphere rains methane. The Huygens probe finally landed and took this picture showing a very orange color on the surface of Titan and a rocky surface. Um, this was, there was only a couple pictures taken because uh, the battery on the Huygens probe was um, not strong enough to transmit for very long. And soon the Cassini orbiter, which was acting as a middleman, uh, transmitting to Earth, um, finally uh, went out of um, out of range. So we only got uh, a little bit of information from the surface of Titan. Here's a look at the relative size of these rocks that you're looking at on the surface of Titan. 
this rock being about 10 centimeters long, about that long right there. More on Titan later when we uh, discuss again the, um, the Jovian moons. But here's a very interesting moon of Saturn, Enceladus. Enceladus is an icy moon. The ice comprised of water. And this icy moon reflects 90% of the light. It's the most reflective object in our solar system. Recently, it was discovered that Enceladus has water geysers. So this icy moon probably has liquid water underneath its ice. And that liquid water shoots out into geysers. And this, uh, the residue of this geyser activity helps to develop the E-ring of Saturn's rings. The E-ring of Saturn's rings is water, snow, more or less, from the uh, geysers of Enceladus. Enceladus is right near the E-ring of Saturn. Very interesting, because if there's water and liquid water on any other terrestrial object, then there, we always think that there's a possibility of life because there must be some kind of internal heat source that's allowing this to be liquid water. And in the case of Enceladus, it's probably the gravitational tidal flexing that's going on as it's being pulled by Saturn and being pulled by the, the uh, other moons in the outer atmosphere. So. This pulling between Saturn and the moons are pulling, pulling uh, Enceladus back and forth, creating an energy source from its uh, interior. So Enceladus has been in the news lately uh, as, a, as one of those worlds, one of those few worlds out there that is very interesting, probably even more interesting than Mars itself as a possible uh, location of uh, life, certainly liquid water. Here's Enceladus is relatively small, though. Here's here's how it compares to the moon, and the moon to the Earth itself. 309 miles in diameter. Here's how it would compare in size to Great Britain. And bring it all home. Here's how Enceladus would compare in size to Alabama. It would extend just about from the northern border of Alabama down to the southern border with Florida. Uh, that is the size of Enceladus. So it's a relatively small moon. One distinguishing feature on Enceladus is these three grooves, four grooves really, if you look at it, on the on this bottom side here and they have been called tiger's stripes and evidently then there is some tiger out in space here and he's not very happy and he has been responsible for swiping and causing these stripes on the surface of Enceladus. Nah, no, nah, just some kind of uh, ancient scraping on Celis, which is uh, as yet unexplained. But the majority of the geysers are coming from those tiger stripe areas, so that's where the the ice is opening up and uh, releasing these uh, water jets. To conclude our uh, discussion of Saturn, here's a very interesting recent picture, also taken by Cassini, but it was taken by Cassini when the, uh, the sun was blocked by Cassini, so it's an eclipse of the sun by the, um, I mean by the Saturn itself, and by doing so, it kind of backlits the whole perimeter and the whole environment around Saturn, and we can see a, you know, a few of the moons here. But here's a very interesting dot right here. This dot right here in this picture is the Earth. 
Now it looks like it's uh, within Saturn's ring system, and that's just a matter of perspective. It's the Earth is hard to see from Saturn because it's so close to the Sun in relation to Saturn. So your best chance to see is during a Saturn eclipse, and by doing so, we can see the Earth uh, within Saturn's, at least in the perspective of Saturn's ring, right here. If, if we blow this up. we can see the Earth, that little blue dot there is us. So we need to wave. Maybe we can see ourselves waving in this picture. That concludes the uh, our lecture, our second lecture in Chapter 7, this one on Saturn.